Okay, so there you see uh, the industry. So the gambling industry um, is what I research have been doing for the past 15 years since I got interested in it as an undergraduate at UC Berkeley. Uh, so the context for what I'm going to talk about today is this dramatic turn over the past three decades from social forms of gambling played at tables with other people to asocial forms of gambling played at video terminals. And you know, there's a lot of hype in the media um, around poker, live poker, et cetera. But if you actually look at the numbers, I believe poker only brings in 3% of revenue. It's not really the money maker in the industry. Uh, classic green felt table games as little as 20 years ago dominated the market, but today they're bringing in 77% of revenue. And if you go to certain jurisdictions, like the local areas of Las Vegas where I work, they bring in as high as 90%. So this is a significant uh, market. Uh, I think Frank Ferenkopf, who's the head of the American Gaming Association, has um, actually said it's the slot machine that drives the industry today. So this is, um, this is the case. And I have been researching over the past 15 years uh, what are we to make of this uh, turn to machines? And what are the consequences of this turn for human experience? You know, I'm a cultural anthropologist, and sometimes my colleagues are a little bit uh, perplexed. You're, you're supposed to sort of look at culture and how people interact with each other, but all you do is think about people in front of these machines. Um, I actually think this is a defining aspect of our culture today, so that's what motivates me. Um, this project began. Uh, as I said, 15 years ago when I was uh, getting my undergraduate um, degree also in anthropology, and I, being a native New Yorker, I'm one of those New Yorkers who rarely goes above 14th Street, very provincial. So California was bizarre enough, and then my boyfriend at the time um, invited me on a trip to Las Vegas with his family. They went there all the time. And I just thought this was the most bizarre place I'd ever been. I'd traveled a little bit in Europe and even in Africa, uh, but to me, um, as this budding anthropologist, Las Vegas seemed like <clears throat> the most uh, exotic place I'd ever been. So I decided I have, to, I have to start researching this. And around that time was what we all know, uh, have come to know through the media as the Disneyification of Las Vegas. So you had these really exotically themed resort parks driven more by family style entertainment than the former kind of mob, uh, mob casino. And you also had the real entrance of the legitimate publicly traded corporation into the Las Vegas scene. So my thesis was a study, I forget actually which casino this is, but it was a study of casinos like this one. Um, and what I did for this thesis was I interviewed casino managers, I interviewed architects, uh, interior designers, you know, how do you choose the carpet? Which way do you want to make it twist? Just to get to the twisting theme. Uh, where do you choose to put your mirrors? What are your accounting practices? How does this all fit together? So my thesis was this analysis of this really complex machine of the contemporary corporate casino and all of its calculating strategies. And something about this account that I came up with always felt a little bit too neat. And at the edges, I was left wondering, how are we supposed to uh, understand how this highly controlled, carefully managed uh, environment of the casino, how do you put that together with the sometimes out of control, unmanaged, um, maybe we could even call them irrational experiences that are unfolding inside the casinos? And is there any relation uh, between the two? So as a way to uh, answer this question, I decided to focus on gambling machines. How are they designed? How are they played? What are the links between design and play? And I chose the gambling machine because it's a technology upon which all the design strategies of the casino that I had looked at, whether it's carpets, whether it's accounting, um, even the, the, set, the acoustics of the environment, all converge on the slot machine. And it's all really about the slot machine. How do we lead people to them? How do we keep people at them, et cetera? Um, and it's seen as the concentrated sort of point of contact where you have an opportunity to um, get inside the heads of uh, gamblers, so to speak. Um, and here's actually a cover inside the mind of the SOT player. This was from, I, I believe, um, the cover of Casino Gaming Magazine from the late, uh, the late 1990s. The rise of gambling machines has totally transformed what casinos look like. Um, this photo gives a sense of the interior of a contemporary casino. This is a tourist uh, property. I believe this might be Paris or Harrah's. Um, 
And note the difference between this layout, which is really kind of jumbled and disorienting, with this layout. This is a locals casino. So right there, I had, a, I had a hint when I started looking at this topic. There's something going on here when you go off the tourist strip into the locals casinos, where you've got people who are known as more mature gamblers, more regular gamblers, um, people who are more, quote, tolerant of technology is the way it's described, but basically a more mature market. They prefer this. Um, and I actually had, a, had an architect uh, tell me, um, you know, local gamblers, tourists, they're on vacation. They kind of like being a little lost. You can spin them around, twist them around uh, inside the casino. They actually, you know, it's part of the vacation to feel a little disoriented and a little bit lost. But locals who've been there for a while, sort of know what they're after, want to cut through. They want to bypass all of that. Um, and they, uh, one designer said, they want to be lined up like cattle at a trough. So you know, I, I couldn't put it in blunter terms. This is uh, a graph from the 2004 resident study, which is published biennially by the uh, Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority. And it's reporting, if you add together video poker and slot machines, this is a 70% preference of, um, of machines. Uh, 20 years earlier, the 1984 study, it was only 30%. So that gives you a sense of this switch. Um, and to give you a sense of how significant this market is, like how many locals are we talking about here, two-thirds of those who re reside in Las Vegas gamble. And of those two-thirds, two-thirds do so heavily, which is defined as twice a week or more with sessions up to um, four hours or more. And, or they do so moderately, which is one to four times a month with sessions of one to four hours. So this is a, this is a significant market we're talking about. And you can see locals' preferences uh, for machines here in an image from a supermarket, um, as well as their preference for easy access. And note that these are not in the back of the store, nor are they tucked away in some side room. They are flanking the entranceway. So you walk off out of the parking lot, and there you are at the checkout on your way out to your car. Um, there you are at these machines. So it's, it's really hard not to go right past them. And there's actually really interesting, people are always fighting, like, let's get the machines out of the supermarkets. This is a big local issue for those who, who believe it compromises on the quality of life in, in the city. So I suspect many of you are familiar with the Las Vegas airport. If you see in the back, it says B something. I believe this is the United Terminal. Um, I've been there more times than I care to remember. But you get right off the plane, just like in the supermarket. There are the machines, and you can gamble up to the second before you leave. And I've, heard stories from gamblers who will um, have a big win and have, be forced to get on the plane, and they'll have to sort of go back immediately to keep gambling, which is a, is a clue to how uh, locals and how gambling addicts are gambling. This isn't really about winning. It's more about staying in the flow of, of the activity. Here's a local gas station. Um, you'll notice that the machines in all of these images are looking the same. Um, they're mostly video poker machines, which is really uh, the, the key game for locals. The more local you get, the more video poker um, you get. It's been described as in the industry as the cash cow, the workhorse, the golden goose. Among locals, it has a different set of names. Um, it's been called electronic morphine, the crack cocaine of gambling, et cetera. So you can kind of skew, skew the value a little differently. Um, if you see these pamphlets, just, just to uh, clue you in on the, the vast therapeutic network that has been spawned by these machines, you can't quite read them, but they say things like, when the fun stops, call this number. They advertise. There's a, I think, uh, ironically, if you're going to be a compulsive gambler, Vegas is the place to, to be that. Um, you have over 100 meetings a week in Gamblers Anonymous. It can be hard to find um, near that number in, in other places. Also advertised in the wall, I think, is a um, drug trial by Eli Lilly, who, uh, this was part of the research I did, was um, co-managing a, a drug trial try specifically for video pokers. Um, what kind of, could you expand the marketability of certain drugs to address the symptoms? So the spread of uh, gambling technologies, and this is what I argue in my work, has transformed not only the economic and physical landscape of Las Vegas, but also um, 
what I like to think of as the experiential landscape of inhabitants. So when I asked a gambler named Molly to describe to me what is it like to live in this city, to live and work in this city, she flipped over the page of her 12-step um, self-help literature. We had just come out of a Gambler's Anonymous meeting, and she actually drew me this map. Um, in the upper left, you've got the MGM. That's where she works and makes room reservations. Then you've got the gas station where she pumps gas and gambles, um, sometimes you know, plays video poker there. Golden Nugget where she, this is a locals casino, where she gambles at night and on weekends. Then you've got the supermarket where she shops and gambles. You've got the clinic where she picks up her medications to treat the anxiety that comes with her gambling problem. And then you've got the strip mall uh, where she attends the weekly Gamblers Anonymous meeting. And that's where we were, um, we were sitting in a, in a diner in that strip mall when she drew me this map. I think this map, and I begin my book with this map, because it conveys the ubiquity of these devices in the everyday life of the, those who live in Las Vegas. Uh, her whole experience is really saturated with these machines. And for the remainder of my time, I'm going to focus on this uh, human-machine pair in the middle of Molly's, in the middle of Molly's map. Um, this here is an image that was given to me by um, another gambler in which she visually describes um, that she was a mistake. Her husband wasn't holding the camera properly, but she said, you know, I always look at this picture, and I think um, that's what um, this zone, gamblers, you'll, you'll hear this word wherever you go if you um, hang out with compulsive gamblers in Las Vegas who play machines. The zone is how they describe what it's like to be playing these machines. And the zone is this dissociated state in which a sense of time, space, the value of money, um, social relations, and even the, a sense of the body itself dissolves and falls away. It's a kind of trance state. Um, this gambler told me, quote, uh, the things going on around me, the people are gone, zoned out. I actually do not hear or see anything around me. The whole world is spinning around you. Uh, it's a kind of dizziness, like a really fast working tranquilizer. So that's what she's getting out of these machines. Um, not taking other people into account and being alone and sort of in your own zone is really a big part of this, this escape form of gambling. One gambler told me, I want to ha hang a do not disturb sign on my back. And she would come up with all, this way, all of these ways to indicate to the cocktail waitresses, do not ask me if I want a drink. I have a liter of Pepsi. Do not ask me if I want cigarettes. Here are my cigarettes. She'd put her feet up. And it was all about insulating herself from any kind of um, human interaction. Another thing that interrupts gamblers in the zone is winning. Now, that's really counterintuitive. Um, but they would complain about it to me over and over again. It's so annoying when I hit a jackpot. Um, this was, you know, I began this research so, so long ago. By now, coins are obsolescent in most, machine, most uh, casinos in Las Vegas. But one woman said, you know, you have, to, you have to wait for the coins to rack up. And it takes so long. And what if the hopper's empty? You have to wait for the cocktail waitress to come fill the hopper. Really, all she wants to do is get back in the zone and keep playing. So it's not that they want to lose either. It's more that they want to maintain a steady flow, a steady balance. You go a little up, you go a little down. The aim, what they're really after, is staying in this, in this flow. So while gamblers talk about the zone, the gaming industry has its own terms. This is not something I made up. Continuous gaming productivity. Um, and I'll read how they define that. And this, this is you know, taken from a publication. While the term productivity often refers to measures such as output per worker, fat, uh, gaming of productivity refers to wagering action or play per patron per interval. Expediting refers to advancing and facilitating gaming action so that players can be more productive because their play is faster, extends for a longer interval, and involves more dollars placed at risk. So there you've got the sort of really rationalized, calculated, scientific sort of version of or correlate to what gamblers experience as, as the zone. And if you attend the Global Gaming Expo, this is one of these big trade shows, which I've been doing um, since the mid-1990s, game developers are really explicit about their aim. So this isn't some sinister, evil empire, and they've all got you know, B.F. Skinner tucked away in their side pockets. This is really the norm. This is, this is quite explicit. And amongst themselves, they freely discuss how to better harness technology to increase uh, what they call time on device, keeping you at that machine as long as humanly possible. That's the whole trick. It's a quote from one of the designers. Um, 
and to promote what is known, this is again not my term, as player extinction, which means um, getting all of a gambler's money, the, the, the whole of his budget, um, before he gets off the machine. It's seen as, you know, like when the telemarketers um, call you, if they don't keep you on the phone until they get your money, that's a failure. So it's somewhat similar there. Today's machines are a far, far cry from the one-armed bandits whose primary purpose when they were introduced was to keep the female companions of the real gamblers who are at the tables um, occupied. So today, instead of coins, as I said, uh, they take player credit cards, and this allows uninterrupted um, credit play. You can insert large bills and you acquire credits instead of having to stop and feed coins. You know, b before credit play, there would be um, long panels held on how can, you know, gamblers have such bad motor skills and they drop coins and, you know, we're losing these crucial seconds to get more, to get more of their budgets. Um, so credit has helped that. Um, push buttons instead of pull handles. So instead of 300 hands of video poker, it's been calculated, you can now play 600. And the gamblers that I worked with who are going to Gamblers Anonymous, they're playing 900 hands an hour. Um, there's features, something called dynamic play rate that actually senses how fast you're playing and it will adapt to your speed and actually knock out some of the graphic components so it can just go more rapidly if you're, if you're that fast. So it's really about attending to the individual who's at the machine. Here's just an image. Uh, this, you know, I, could, I could go on about this for an hour and what the algorithms inside of the machine, et cetera, but basically to communicate that what this does, when you can be betting hundreds of credits on numerous different lines in one second, it's basically like condensing you know, 50 hands into one unit of time. So you're compressing everything in. So that's um, just a, these are called multi-line multipliers. So it gets that sense. You're multiplying your profits here. Uh, a key tactic for time on device is physical comfort by way of ergonomic design. Um, one company makes these screens that slant at precisely you know, 38 degrees. Here's a quote from that company. Why should we force players to lean in? It's just not comfortable. We move the players closer to the screen, just enough to keep their backs snug against the backs of their chairs, which was easy because our no buttons touch screen doesn't put a barrier between the player and the screen. And now, because they can't slouch in their seats, they don't get tired as easily. So it's not just the machines. It's also the seating and the whole environment around the machines. Um, meticulous attention is paid to the height of seats in relation to the buttons. Seats are made to eliminate, I'm quoting here, eliminate hard, sharp edges coming in contact with the main arteries of the legs, which causes circulation to be cut and the legs to fall asleep. So you see uh, that the, the flow of gambler's circulation is linked to the flow of their time and money into these, um, into these machines. Uh, right there you see increased time on device. These immersion touch technology, I think it's since changed the name of the company, has developed these screens that, will, that have little actuators behind different functions in the screen. So you'll touch you know, play or bet max or something and it will um, buzz back at you or pulse back at you in some way. And it's meant to give you this sort of confirming, there's this whole literature around what this does and how it, it better, um, it, it gives you a sort of confirming sense of transaction. So again, it's an attention to what is human experience and how can we better integrate um, our, our technologies with that experience. Um, other kind of strategies include um, bringing physicists on to reduce the, the destructive interference in the noise, uh, the, the noise cancellation technology and designing special sound cones. This is a campaign by WMS Gambling, um, and this gets to the crux of the, the attention paid to customer experience. And so the campaign was called What Players Want, to see, to hear, to feel. All elements of experience are being addressed by these machines. The philosophy here is really how to attend to, uh, to human uh, desires. And uh, you, know, you go to the Global Gaming Expo and you've got panels about player experience. We're in, we don't want to be in an engineer vacuum. Let's bring in the players. They bring players in to speak. They ask, you know, what's going on at the machine? What's your experience like? How can we better keep you there? We need ongoing connectivity. So again, the theme of connectivity coming up with our players. And I, I can't resist taking a, a moment um, since it's so on theme. So, so Harris used a lot of its research to um, 
on players and massive amounts of real-time data to, to design this algorithm um, which would detect who out there on the floor is about to leave because they've reached what is called their pain point. And how can we flip a pain point into a good experience? A good experience was the term that's being used. And so they would dispatch what they called luck ambassadors out to those players at the crucial moment of pain and say, here's a meal coupon, or you know, here's some sort of bonus, um, and here's a quote describing that. I see you're having a rough day. I know you like our steakhouse. Here, I'd like you to take your wife dinner uh, on us right now. So it's no longer pain. It becomes a good experience. And so I just wanted to um, bring that here uh, and have us think a little bit about um, a kind of engineering of experience, which is maybe not exactly what Jell would recognize as constituting a good experience. Um, yeah, so just to get back to Molly, and here's her map, which again is a certain kind of twist, but it's a, it's a very self-enclosed loop. So there's no exits off of this road. It's kind of a closed circuit, and she's suspended in the middle. It's sort of the, the, the dark side of the twist, I guess you could say. Um, I don't believe that creating addicts is the aim of machine designers. Um, machine life, as Molly described it to me after she drew her map, she said, this is really a machine life. Machine life is not what they're explicitly after, but it just so happens that their efforts, which totally make sense within their industry to maximize profits by making machines that are more and more effective at extracting money from players, for all intents and purposes, treats everybody who sits down as a potential addict. And I mean that quite literally. Um, somebody who will sit there and keep at it until their means are thoroughly um, depleted. Uh, so I think I can stop there. Um, you know, well, OK, so not to be a total downer uh, before or, or a wet blanket um, about the possibility of of good experience and profit maximization or something like that is coexisting. Let me just um, you know, suggest that perhaps there are ways, and I would leave that to you to think about, of, of tweaking the logic from one that's about um, player extinction and maximization to more about player optimization. Um, and I think this, you could see this more broadly when you get to climate issues. You know, certainly, it's quite. Uh, profit maximization is a short-sighted and unsustainable practice. We don't want to max, if you're in an industry um, like this, you don't want to max out your whole player market. So it actually would behoove both players and the entertainment industry to think more along these lines. So I'll just leave you with that. Thank you. Very nicely done. Thank you.